You're listening to the Comic Crusaders Podcast. I am your host, Al Mega, CEO of Comic Crusaders and Undercover Capes. In this show, I'm sitting down with creators from all walks of life to talk about inspiration, process, the lessons they've learned, and a whole lot more. It's your boy, Al Mega. Welcome to a brand new Comic Crusaders podcast. Wow, my 410th episode. And what's awesome is the guest that I have here, it's been over a year on my 297th. It was the last time I spoke to him. I mean, so we have a whole year of watching chairs, we say, you know what I mean, to catch up on. But he has an upcoming amazing project. I had the opportunity to read that second issue of this project coming out. Yeah, the ex-wives of Frankenstein. Let me issue one out there now. We're going to find out where you could buy that. Let me introduce the incredible creator over here, a good friend of the comic crusaders, do one, the only, the very talented Mr. Richard Fragray, baby. How you doing? I'm good. I'm back in L.A., so I'm happy. <laughs> oh, you're back, you're back home, brother. If you're back home, you're good. What, what's going on? What happened then? What do you mean you're back? So what, what happened in the last year, Rich? Oh my, I mean, like, there's so much, but uh, I guess the long story short version is, I guess long story longer version is, I finally got my work visa to come back to the US, uh, and then immediately after I arrived, I got mugged and lost all my ID, and then had what? to go back to Canada to get it replaced, and now I've been for three months, right. and I've just gotten back to LA again now. <laughs> wait, 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 where did you get mugged? Uh, I was in West Hollywood, I was walking home. And so this is like, like because I can't do anything just the easy way. Um, I did. I, I I say that I got mugged. I got hit in the head by someone. I don't remember any of this happening. I was walking home. Someone hit me in the head. I tried to make four phone calls. I the only person who answered was my mother, and she told me this the next day. I told her that I'd been hit in the head. That I didn't know where I lived, but I think it's in a straight line that they don't have uber in america so i have to walk and that i'm really hungry and then i hung up on her uh and then all i know is that about a mile away from where i got hit uh i fell unconscious in a uh, garden in a in the like parking lot of a gas station what? and somewhere between midnight and 4 a.m somebody covered me in or through or did live or something uh covered me in their shit what? Uh, which i because i woke up Wait, this, I, this is I, like the worst movie ever right now i woke up and there was this uh, i try i promise you if i ever make a movie it'll be worse than this uh, i woke up this guy was shouting at me and like kind of like poking me with a stick because he didn't want to touch me and he just kept yelling you shit yourself and i kept saying to him no it's all on the outside because it was all outside <laughs> of my clothes uh but on my face and uh, my my bag was missing. And now he was great because he said to me, he keeps he kept saying this while he like he stayed with me while I called someone to come and get me. But he kept saying to me, at first I thought you were just some drunk homeless guy, but then I saw you had nice jewelry, so I thought I should help you. So he was like a real hero, you know. Um, but so now I know that I can survive that, which I didn't know before. And uh, yeah, so that meant that I I didn't I had to get a new passport before I could re-enter Canada. And then once I got into Canada, I had to get the U.S. visa replaced again and then get a permanent resident card for Canada because I'm actually not a citizen there. I'm from New Zealand originally. Um, and I had to wait for that to arrive before I could leave. So everything was set up to start doing work. I was meant to be doing this like whirlwind tour of conventions in like it was like uh, New York and then uh England and then I was doing some book signings in Germany and then I had a thing in France and then I was meant to come back to LA and do a show here then a show in San Francisco and then back to LA for another thing and then back to I was meant to have like four months where I wasn't in the same place for more than a week at a time and all of that got canceled and everything else got canceled and I was like cool I'll just get back to work and like make a bunch more comics that's fine I like doing that but the comic that I was halfway through at the time was about a cranky old gay man who uh, was traumatized by an assault and no longer left his house much. So it became really depressing to draw. So I put that one on hold and I made a thing about ghosts. All right. All right. But damn, bro, I, I, I'm glad that you're okay and, and, and with us. Uh, I know that must have been a horrible experience. I mean, it sounds fucking, Jesus Christ, bro. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, there's no words, but but again, I, I, at least the very much I can say is I'm glad you're okay and you're here and you're able to still create for us. You know, I mean, look, look, look at that dope crib. I like the background you got going on. And now, you know, let's start talking about that creative journey now in the year. You know, right. after that horrible life experience. God. <laughs> um, so talk to me about this, though, because this is, you sent me this issue, The Ex-Wives of Frankenstein. This is number two, something that's upcoming. But but I you know I was digging it. I mean, not not having the first issue, now you know, questions was like, what is going? I I kind of understand what's going, but introduce me to this war witch. What is going on here in the ex wives of Frankenstein? What was that first issue all about? I mean, okay, so it's um it's a it's a four issue miniseries. Issue two will be on Kickstarter very soon. Uh, I th we should be in pre launch by the end of this week. Um, it is a modern reimagining of the aftermath of the Frankenstein story. So uh, three years after uh, Victor Frankenstein and his monster have disappeared somewhere in the Arctic, uh, it's they are discovered living as a gay couple uh, and, uh, and obviously alive and well, and they are now returning to the city. And my book focuses on uh, Elizabeth Frankenstein and the Bride of the Monster, who haven't spoken in three years, who have a lot of resentment towards each other, uh, but know that no one else could possibly understand what they are about to go through. So it's a story about them spending the day together, the day their husbands are coming back as heroes of uh, Reddit and Twitter and the MRA movement. And you kill me, because let me tell you, when I was, when I was reading this, I got to do ask about this, though, because you know, hopefully it's not a spoiler, but the movement, what is Jesus Christ? If you could act, make this any longer, two LGBTQIA plus. <laughs> what is the two? What the, what uh, two, two is for uh, two is for two spirit, which is uh, sort of the the um, uh, the indigenous uh, designation of transgender people. I think um, it's so. I'm sort of I'm I'm trying to use trying to use all of the correct lettering in there but i'm very deliberately using a mixture of the american designation and the canadian designation because okay. the 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 joke i'm doing is how eager the uh people on television are to get it right oh yeah i, I see it it's letting me laugh in, in a particular scene here all right but all right so in that person talk, talk to me about you know the, the relationship of, of, of the frankenstein monster and the bride there because uh when i'm again being introduced here things are different mm -hmm. things are going on i mean do what do we get in that first issue do we get you know kind of the experience of that relationship at all no you you never see the man in this story um i i think they're they've had their story told enough um uh the story is it's it's about it's mostly about the bride of the monster who's now going by Victoria Frankenstein uh, as she deals with like being a green woman stitched together, but who is still somebody's sexual fantasy and living in a modern world as like an object of fetishization. And uh, you know, the, the one person who probably should understand what she's gone through and understand what life is like for her is Elizabeth Frankenstein. But Elizabeth comes from this incredible place of privilege where she has, also had to protect herself and accept a lot of things just to get by. Um, you know, in the original novel, uh, Elizabeth is literally a, a kid, a girl from a poor family that Victor's mother says, oh, you're too pretty to be poor and adopts her. Mm -hmm. And then says to Victor when he's five years old, here is your new younger sister. She's here for your every pleasure. And then he grows up and fucking marries her. So, you know, you can imagine how, how, damaging that is to a person uh and so she has like protected herself with whatever armor she can gather most of that being wealth and she has uh been pretty shitty to victoria and let victoria kind of take the blame for being just another monster so the first issue is it's it's the day they find out it's um it opens with victoria you know answering the door elizabeth is there with the newspaper headline saying they're alive um hmm. And the, the closest you ever get to a picture of uh, Victor and the monster is a cropped photograph that is sort of, if people are very uh, astute about it, they'll notice that it might match the, the well-known photo of uh, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell and Elon Musk. Gotcha. So let me ask you here. 
how do you approach the character development then, you know, in, in that first issue? You know, what were you digging into? Um, I was really digging into what it means to be uh, created for someone else and what it feels like to, uh, what it feels like to be the um, afterthought in a story about somebody else's genius. Hmm. Uh, I'm really interested in, you know, the, these, these, men who were who were considered terrible when things went wrong but i'm sure up until that point had absolutely been celebrated all of their lives and these women who were meant to just kind of go along with it so while victoria has literally been stitched together from corpse pieces to make the monster happy elizabeth has been given as an object to victor when he was a kid and has been there to make him happy so it's sort of i'm looking at what it means to uh to not have your own story and have to try and figure out what that is later on. Gotcha. So talk to me, did you face any challenges while you were building this, you know, in creating the storyline? Uh, I actually, I didn't really, this one came to me really easily. Um, okay. Like the, the actual, the premise for it. Uh, there's about five years ago, um, I started just tinkering with this, this notion of the, like, the title because, you know, obviously there's so many, the son of Frankenstein, the bride of Frankenstein, the 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 blank of Frankenstein, and uh, and I said it as a, as a joke once. The ex wives of Frank, or I said the ex wife of Frankenstein, and that led me down this path of of figuring out who these originally who Elizabeth was, and then who um, who Victoria would be. I had um, I had some sort of different versions of it along the way. There was a a period in the beginning where I was going to make it entirely about Victoria and just this almost like a one woman show about being a monster, but still having people want to fuck you. Um, <laughs> and then, and I was going to have sort of Elizabeth looming large as this uh, threatening presence from her old life, but actually have her never show up, which is kind of what I ended up doing with the, with uh, Victor and his monster uh, in the final version. But yeah, like th there were, there were points where it was, it was always just in the back of my mind. Like maybe this is a sitcom. Maybe this is a, a TV drama. Maybe this is a movie. Maybe this is literally a stage show. Um, and then uh, I had just finished working on um, uh, one of the issues of Haunted Hill. And, you know, I, 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 I pushed pretty hard to have the surreal supernatural stuff come through in Haunted Hill in like really unexpected ways. Um, you know, there are a lot of ghosts in Haunted Hill, but they're all buried underground, so you never see them. Uh, and it just creates the sense of weirdness. There's an idea that things are more possible. And I thought, why am I always doing this thing where I don't actually show the weird part? And uh, then I had this, so I, I just, I, I made a, a, a reference to it online somewhere, and I just said, no, I'm, I'm stating it now here. This is going to be my next, um, my next comic. And I, I posted a screen grab of, uh, I posted a photograph of, of the, the Google doc where it just said the ex-wives of Frankenstein. And I thought this will just disappear into the void. Maybe it'll be the next thing I make. Maybe it won't. And then, uh, I was working on another book. I had a kid's book to finish and I was in a Twitter space and somebody else, um, started talking about the ex wives of Frankenstein. And they, they, what they said was they'd seen the title. They couldn't remember who came up with it, but the title in and of itself evoked so many ideas. They couldn't wait to see it. And I panicked yeah. because I thought like, if the title on its own can evoke ideas, then other people are going to start doing something with this. Heck yeah. Heck. And so I actually, I made, I made all four issues in a little under four weeks. Um, oh. And yeah, I was working like a, a maniac. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I'm really glad I did because, like, l since I launched the first one back in uh, what August last year, there have been there's been so many different Frankenstein things showing up. You know, there's there's a there's a new Frankenstein movie. There's a there's um, Lisa Frankenstein that came out last week. There's Poor Things, obviously, which I think is just like an absolute masterpiece. Yeah. Um, so it, it sort of feels like either I'm gonna get completely left behind or uh if i release it too slowly i'll get seen as the person who came afterwards or i have tapped into something and everyone's really interested in frankenstein right now and that would be great i think you're telling us something because it is definitely a whole different uh, look into it you know it's, it definitely has its moment so how are you balancing that humor with the storytelling particularly in this story because I, I definitely could tell you with the second issue i had a laugh out loud moments like oh shit fucking richard <laughs> 
Yo, your funny ass writer, bro. Let me tell you, there was a moment, and it kind of in the beginning, just I'll, I'll just say in the subway, so you know what I'm talking about. I know that what you mean. Yeah, so funny. Holy shit. You mean the picture that I posted in isolation and people got really mad about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the, one of the things that I really love about the story is um, I like stories where you get to see uh, how people are. Um, oh, yeah. That, that, so there's that's from the first campaign. That That yeah. is, by the way, an actual um, idea. You know, and get a tease of what we're looking at for number two that's coming soon, folks. You know what I'm saying? But this is the first campaign. There's no. her, her sexy shower sequence. Um, there's a there's something I think that's really interesting about the way that we view um, the way that we view people going through something terrible or difficult as uh, still having to behave correctly. And I think obviously publicly we kind of do. Like we cannot we cannot be the wrong kind of we cannot grieve the wrong way. We cannot. Because every everyone's paying attention to us, and they'll question everything we do. If we say the wrong thing in the moment, it's recorded now; it'll be remembered forever. Um, and me, I, <laughs> I wanted to show like this this idea of this these women who are have just found out that like their husbands are coming back, which is absolute chaos for them. But also that their husbands are now publicly a gay couple, which is super messed up when you consider that one of them built the other. Yeah. Um, but also it means that these two men have absolute cover to never be criticized <laughs> because there's like, like, oh, uh, if, if your, if your husband leaves you because he, uh, the monster he built goes on a rampage and destroys the city, uh, then you are, you are the sympathetic character. I mean, probably there have been some questions as to how much she knew going into it or whatever, but like, she's still a sympathetic character. If your husband leaves you because he's finally found his truth, you can't be angry. And she cannot be public. She has to be publicly supportive of him. And she has just found out. And I love being able to show the raw moment of anger and bitterness as she as yeah. she goes through that development. It's not just that, because that also brings into question why the bride even exists. If this is what was possibly maybe intended by Doc Frank, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so what was the purpose of the bride's truly existed? Was she truly a bride? And if so, who's? <laughs> exactly. And and I think that, you know, um, there, there's a, uh, in a later issue, uh, Elizabeth says, she says, I, I think that, I think you were created mostly for me so that I'd have a friend. I think like that Victor and the monster were, had decided if they made another lady to be there to balance out the dinner party, then the two of them could get away with whatever they were planning. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because Victor, like Elizabeth is older, Victor is obviously older as well. Uh, Victoria is literally three years old <laughs> since, you know, she only started existing from the point where she was reanimated. Um, but, you know, Victor and Elizabeth were, were much older. They're from a different time. Like, Victor's ability to be an out gay man in the uh, advanced medical sciences was probably pretty limited for him. So instead, he did the logical thing and dug up a bunch of corpses. So let me ask you, does the first issue have similar to the second one, like kind of those new sequences and people talking? Because that reminded me so much of Spawn, <laughs> the early days when they would have the news guys talking, you know? Um, there's the first one just has. Uh, them reading the newspaper article. It has uh, Victoria reading little snippets from the newspaper article when they get it. But the first one's very, um, it's very small. It's entirely contained within uh, Victoria's tiny, shitty apartment. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep, um, all four issues are kind of located in one place. Um, yeah. The second yeah. one, you know, you have the subway, but then almost all of it's in the bar. Yeah. Uh, and then the third one is entirely in um, Elizabeth's apartment, which looks a lot like Castle Frankenstein if it were a big glass skyscraper apartment. Um, and and then the fourth one is in another bar in a, in a nice hotel. <laughs> but I really wanted to show like how 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 tiny Victoria's life has to be compared to Elizabeth's. But I want to add here, you know, any influence from, from Herman Munster, because I remember last time we spoke, you professed your love for Grandpa there. But, you know, does, does Herman Munster have any influence in, in, in your monster here, if we ever get to see him? Because, you know, is, is there a possibility we ever will, you know, if we go beyond this? I, I don't want to say never, but 
in the story as it's written so far, you never see Victor or the monster. Okay. Um, it's not their story. I'm not interested in them. But this book really only covers the first day of their, um, the, you know, it's 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 two ladies having a nice day together, or really a it's, sort of unpleasant day together. I dig it. I dig it. Uh, I I I think that if I do continue the series, which I never know because I I have an idea for a I have an idea for a second volume, but it sort of feels like it's the kind of idea that would open it up to thirty new volumes, and I don't know if I want to do that. Um, the story certainly stands alone. Uh, I think I would try and keep the men out of it for as long as humanly possible, but I think eventually, obviously, they'd have to come in. Uh, in in number three, you uh, there's a, another character from the novel, um, uh, Victor's best friend, and you find out some sort of twisted uh, history there. But really, I'm keeping it pretty pretty much focused on just these two. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, so you know. You say it's coming soon. You said by by when? Because we gotta get people to start. You know, are you gonna have a pre-launch page? What's popping here, Rich? Because I think people need to start digging into this now and get ready. You know, it's tax season, so there's no excuse for people not to have money. So you did this at the right time, bro. Well, uh, I was hoping actually that the pre-launch would be live before we went live today, uh, but it's still sitting. In, as soon as it's out of review, it'll be launched. I um, because of the whole mugging thing. Being stuck in Canada, I couldn't fulfill my last Kickstarter campaign as quickly as I'd wanted to. So I shipped the last package for that on Saturday, and then uh, so and then sent off the thing for review the minute I had uh, shipped the last package. So sometime this week there will be a pre-launch page. Uh, I think the campaign will go live on February 27th because on the 29th I have a panel at ECCC about. Frankenstein. So that seems like good timing. Yeah, I love it. I was about to ask that too, man. You know, Rich on the convention tour scene. So what's yeah. going on? You say you're going to go wild until your unfortunate incident. But now that you're, we're back, it's 2024, baby. What is popping on, on, on the Fair Gray Verse tour? Okay, so I've got ECCC at the end of February. I'm just doing two panels and I'll be kind of hanging out. I'm not tabling. Okay. Um, I'll be at WonderCon in March. I'll be at the LA Festival of Books in April. Uh, oh, uh, Vancouver Fan Expo this weekend, actually. Um, oh, that's nice. the soonest one. Uh, so, if anyone's in Vancouver, come see me. Um, what is that show? I, you know, I, 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 I'm an American, I'm here in the States. I mean, I haven't well, been to Canadian Con yet. You know, is it similar to a US Con? Is it like a hotel con? Like, what? what? No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a big, huge con. It's the same. It's it, you know the fan expo shows like Mega Con okay. and all, all those. Right. Uh, it's part of that chain, and it's run like it's all run by the same people. And it's, uh, it's the biggest con we have in Vancouver, and it absolutely fucking rules. Um, right. So people should come see me there. Then I've got uh, Calgary Fan Expo in April. Uh, something in May that I can't remember off the top of my head. I think I'm going to be at Heroes Con in June, and then Q Con in LA in June, and then. July, of course, is San Diego. Uh, I think August, I have nothing officially planned yet, but then September is Baltimore and, uh, oh, and then back to LA and then to New York. And then I think I'm going to go do the European stuff for the end of the year and then get back in time for the San Francisco show in late November. All right. Holy shit. Ritz has the year planned. Ah, he ain't planned. So, is this the only project that you're trying to do? <laughs> you know, that's this the is my only project. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so is this the? Oh, yeah, I know. I'm, I know, Rich. I know you keep busy, but but how many projects is planned? Are you you're planning on for 2024? Okay, so look, that's I've gone. Good. I turned 40 April 19th, 2025. Okay. Oh, right, my birthday the 24th. I need. I'm 49. <laughs> I need to have 300 books published by the time I turn 40, because. All right. As you know, anyone who doesn't have that has just completely failed. Everyone knows that. It's a basic standard for <laughs> every 300 published books. I'm at 271 right now. Bro, I'm behind by 300 then. God damn. Well, I mean, you'll, it's fine. You've got time. Um, <laughs> so I've got, I've got 29 books that I have to somehow get out by April next year. Um, I'm hoping all culminating in my like magnum opus, which is currently titled... I'm only drawing Danny DeVito as the Penguin until I stop wanting to fuck him, an in-depth review of Batman Returns. Um, 
I have so this year I've got uh, a book called Whale coming out through Blue Fox, which is um, it's a it's a ghost story that pos pos posits the question why do ghosts whale? Um, I've got uh, a book called Frog Alley, which is a exploration of being too weird to exist, so you just stop being alive. Also through Blue Fox, I've got a book called um, uh, Stolen Water about a, a sort of a Pinocchio story about a man raising a plant to be his son. Um, I've got, uh, obviously, Ex-Wives 2, 3, and 4. I've got mm -hmm. Haunted Hill 3 and 4, uh, mm -hmm. like books 3 and 4 of that, not just issues. Um, I will have Richard Fairgrey comic book character, a collection of a cartoon strip that I used to do online back before I moved to America. And I'm just putting together two short collections that are called uh, Richard Fairgrey comic book character, The Good Ones, and more. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing a... Uh, an ongoing scene. Well, I started this thing that was meant to be an eight page ghost story. And then I was like, well, I can make it a 24 page ghost story, explore the characters a little bit more. And then I realized that at 24 pages, I'd come up with a much more interesting character. And the ghost part was, or the spooky part was so small that actually this needs to be a huge coming of age, sprawling narrative that is more about somebody learning to, uh, grow out of Marvel films than anything else. But that's called Wet Cement. So that's okay. a six issue run. Um, I've got this thing, The Lights That Guide You Home, which is the one about the cranky old gay man who's scared to leave his apartment. But it's it's a it's a spooky story about a, a town that replaces its streetlights with much brighter bulbs. And it all it does is make the shadows darker and things start growing out of them. Okay. Um, I have what else have I got? This guy's a madman for you. Here's the guy. There's, there's something else. I can't remember. Oh, I'm doing a thing called Skinny because I had this. I, I joked the other day when I said we should, well, the other day, several months ago, I said we should really call fat people skinny because they have more skin. And I started thinking about what's the monster that collects our skin. It's the skinniest monster. And it's just sort of a sack of skin oozing around the place. And I think it's something to do with like a kid who cleans his bedroom so well that the monster that eats the the skin from the dust particles gets hungry and starts eating him in his sleep. Holy shit, bro. You're scaring me. I shouldn't be cleaning my room then. <laughs> <laughs> bro, all right. I all right. That concept right there, you're fucking terrifying me. You, that, that 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 sounds like like uh, uh, uh definitely a new horror movie in the Blumhouse uh <laughs> franchise. Let's go, Gregory. I, I need to see that as a fucking movie, not just a comic book. Yeah, Please. and I, I um I signed on to Ghostwriter thing today that I'm obviously not allowed to talk about because I'm the ghostwriter. But uh if you see a book that's edited by me, it probably means I ghost wrote it. That'll be coming next year. And um oh I'm doing I'm 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 playing with this idea at the moment. Nothing's in place yet. Uh it's a it's a, I'm interested in the idea that if a death is big enough, it'll attract other death. Uh, you know, just sort of the gravity of death. And I'm thinking if a monster dies, most people would think it was a good thing. But when something that big dies, it brings other death to it. And I'm thinking of doing a sort of almost like a like an infinite scroll, but in print form. So I'm thinking of literally doing an actual scroll um, of a, a, a sea monster sinking to the bottom of the ocean and pulling death in with it. Oof. Huh, so wow. I, I think it would be sort of a... Not not quite as not quite like one single image, but like essentially you'd be following the monster down as all of the fish come in to eat it, and as they do, uh, they get trapped inside the monster that they're eating, and the pressure gets too great, and they burst, causing more fish to come in and eat them. Holy, shit. this guy's a madman, folks. You see what I'm saying about this guy? An amazing creator. Fire projects on the way. An amazing tour he's going to be doing this year as well. I mean, you could keep posting on the website I've been showing nonstop, Richard, Gregory.com. You know what? Let me add this for a moment, too, so you guys check out the website so you know you go to the right place. It's right here, RichardFragrate.com, comic creator, a bunch of comic series. You can see everything he's been working on, has all his social links, doing a mailing list. What do they get at the mailing list? Um, well, that's sort of complicated. They used to get a thing I called Disaster Peace Theater, where I would... Um, I would send a story out each week of some ridiculous thing I'd done. I, I tend to head like I, I run head first into adventures and a lot of them were like, um, maybe I was oversharing a bit. And then last year 
um, I had a couple of incidents where some people, people who were close to me kind of used stories from my life as sort of punchlines for their, like, essentially, like, I realized I was the most interesting person in their world. And they were using me to make themselves seem more interesting. And I felt very exploited by it. So mm. I am figuring out where the line is between oversharing and, uh, and being like, and not hiding. Cause you know, I spent, I think when you and I first spoke, I had just stopped doing kids book stuff. Yeah. And a big part of that was because whenever I did an interview for kids books, I would come away from it feeling like I'd fucked up because like, I never, I never get the line right as to what I can say. Like, did I, did I swear accidentally? Did I whatever? And there was this one day where, um, I was, I, I was promoting Haunted Hill at the same time that I was promoting Cardboardia. And I'm about to do this interview. I can't remember which one it was for. Right before we start, the interviewer says, by the way, I read Haunted Hill. I fucking love it. So I'm like, okay, cool. I know. And then he says, first question, um, hey, okay, so Richard, a lot of the places in your book are based on real locations. What's your favorite one? And I said, oh, Slamtown, the sex club that Eva works at, is actually based on Slammer here in LA. It's my favorite. It's a prison-themed sex club. And their big huh. to fame is that they have uh, the longest succatorium in Southern California. And he just That's stared at me. And I said, oh, sorry, a succatorium is like a big, long wall of glory holes. But what differentiates Slammer is that the, uh, the people getting sucked go up a ramp and the people doing the sucking are on the ground floor. And so their dicks come through holes of different heights. But it means that no one has to be on their knees. And you don't want to be on your knees at Slammer because the floor gets pretty gushy. Yeah, and it, it turns out I was doing an interview about Cardboardia, my children's series about kids from Brooklyn who can travel through cardboard boxes to an imaginary world. And I was speaking live to a group of librarians. Um, and the world didn't end. I didn't catch on fire. It was fine. But I like looked at it. I was like, oh, the worst thing that could have happened has happened. Fuck it, I'm done. I'm going to be public about everything. I'm never going to try and yeah. mitigate the Richard disaster of it all moving forward. And so I didn't. And I put out this newsletter and I spoke on a lot more interviews and I was very open and honest about every single aspect of everything. And then um, I had a I had a medical problem where I they found some uh, some spots on the on the white matter in my brain. And they didn't know what it was, and I had to go back for tests, but I had to like wait a year to go back for follow-ups to see if they'd grown. It could have been a sign of like early onset dementia, or it could just be uh, long COVID, and it could be stagnant. And so I was waiting to hear the results of that. I hadn't really told anyone. I had told one friend, former friend, uh, and she's a very bitter, jealous person with very little going on in her life, and when we were a, a group of us were together and she very much knew she was the only person who knew um and the conversation had a lull she said hey richard do you have the results of your brain problem yet to the end like started just talking about it in front of everyone including oh, like an ex of mine and i sort of realized like oh like i do, i wasn't comfortable telling everyone about it yet because i didn't know the results and i didn't want people worrying by the way, the end result is it was a it was an effect of COVID, and there is no growth of these spots. It nope. looks like I'm fine. I have to get tested every year, but you know, at the moment, everything seems fine. Um, but like, because that was the thing I couldn't share, she had then shared it for me yeah. and weaponized it to make herself seem important. Like it was an ownership thing. She needed. People I to get make, it, brother. I've yeah. been there, done that. I won't say who, but there was a big moment in my life that I was supposed to share. Mm. And someone like cut me off from sharing what I should have shared. And it's like, you know, they stole a very important moment from me. Like you say, in order for them yeah. to feel important. Because they want to be able to say. To like, day, I feel, to this day, I feel a type of way. But, you know, what can I do? It's the past. You can't change it unless they make a time machine soon enough. Look, <laughs> if they ever make a time machine, I'm going to, I don't want to use it for anything really good. You know, <laughs> listen with the with the way you write so many effing books, I'm pretty sure that you're definitely gonna be up to some 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 crazy. Oh now. yeah, I would just get more work done. I would just go back in time, see my younger self, and be like, "Look, Richard, these ones suck. Jump to this. Here, here's the script. I'm gonna write scripts and send them back to you. Just draw them. Learn how to draw this thing better sooner. Don't waste your time, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm gonna be comfortable when I get back." <laughs> <laughs> if I have to come back, I'm going to kick your ass. 
I and imagine the beauty you remember the day that I beat myself. <laughs> if comic, if, I beat myself daily. If comic creators could travel in time, though, they would just be showing up screaming, "Look after your back. Do wrist exercises." You know what I mean? I, I, I feel, oh, bro, right? I, I, I think you should have really gone back to this mugging. Don't go down this motherfucking street tonight, uh, unless you want to wind up being shat on. Well, it's just been that. But then I would never know that being shit on by a stranger doesn't kill me. Folks, uh, if you just tune in, uh, you rewind. Yeah. Rich, <laughs> Rich has been through something in the past year. But again, I'm happy that he's okay. He's here. And he definitely has his 2024 planned out. So please make sure to support independent creators like Rich. He's out there. He's having fun. The story is dope. The Exorcist of Frankenstein. I mean, uh, Real my son me that, that the first one, so I heard get in line because mm -hmm. I was digging the slice of life feel. Like I said, laugh out loud moments outside even that one that I mentioned. There's a couple of moments there, but also insight and like, okay, what a different perspective on, on, on the mythos. So I definitely dig the way that you're kind of doing this, brother. So you know, I'm definitely looking forward to see you know where else it goes. And folks, if you're interested, again, check out richardfregory.com. Then also check, you know, Kickstarter is going to be the pre-launch ready really soon. And if you want to stay in tune with that, all you got to do is follow him on social with on Twitter, which is Richard Fairgray. On Instagram, it'll be Richard Fairgray Author, all right? So show the love. The links are below, too. I make life easy for everybody. But this is what you got to do to support amazing independence like Rich. So before we go, brother, and, and the lessons of this year, being shot on, coming up with a whole bunch of stuff and being inspired afterwards, I mean, like... Uh, what advice you have for folks, you know, and I hope it doesn't take another year before you fucking come on. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll book it again. Look, I tried to book again with you, but you were busy. You're very popular. Conventions, conventions, man. I was like, yeah, listen, I was in New York and unfortunately you weren't there, right? You said this year? I was in New York. Damn, man, I missed you. Well, let's plan on this year to definitely at least meet in person and say hello. All right. All right, we'll do we'll do a live one next time. No, we'll do we'll do another couple like this, and then we'll do a live one in New York. Cause that's ages. Oh, we could definitely do a live one in New York. I love that because we have the media spot. You come over and, and okay. we get a lockdown, and people see you're actually from the booth. All mm -hmm. right, so let's get back to it. What type of advice after this year that you've had? <laughs> um, we live in a cursed world, and it hurts to make anything beautiful, but that's not a reason not to do it. Oh wow. That is beautiful. I love that. Richie, other man, thank you again for coming on to the program to talk about what you got going on, this amazing story, the future. You know what I mean? That wild story, folks. Uh, it's his story, so I better not see this in the comic book. You know, I asked me permission because that does sound wild. Like, wow. Uh, insane. Thank you for sharing. Cause, and again, oh, oh so. I forgot. I remember I said there's something else I was doing, and I can't remember it. Yeah. I'm doing a second volume of horror shorts, and then I'm going to do a collection of short story of short horror stories about um, eating and shitting called "Things That Go Dump in the Night." Oh shit! <laughs> well, <laughs> no pun intended. All right, there you go. For this, listen, you see this guy? His mind is out there. A lot of fun stuff, uh, funny stuff. Make sure to check it out. All right, and with that, thank you so much, Richard, the man. Thank My you. crusaders, thank you for tuning in. Much love. Hasta la próxima. Weba. Thank you for listening to thank the Comic Crusaders podcast. podcast. If you like the content, you like the content, please, please subscribe, and, please turn subscribe and turn on notifications. Also, please visit ComicCrusaders.com and our extended podcast family over at UndercoverCapes.com. And also, make sure to download the Comic Crusaders app on the Play Store today.